Welcome everybody to this uh, webinar on uh, governance, fragility and insurgency in the, in the Sahel, a hybrid uh, political order in the making. Uh, my name is uh, Morten Bøos, I'm a research professor at NUPI uh, and I have edited the, uh, this special issue that we are launching today, a special issue of the International Spectator. Um, an issue that I've edited together with my uh, dear friend and colleague, uh, Professor uh, Francesco Strassari at the Santa Ana School of Advanced Studies. Uh, and we have all the authors with us uh, in this webinar. Uh, they will be introduced soon. And we are also happy that we have a broad and uh, very knowledgeable audience with us. So thank you to all of you who has joined us. I'm uh, apologizing that we started um, four minutes late, uh, but um, I hope uh, that you uh, accept that. Uh, I'm not going to speak for long and neither Francesco because we would, uh, we would like really to have the, give the authors time to introduce very interesting uh, articles. But um, first of all, let me um, say that uh, part, uh, um, a considerable part of this special issue comes out uh, from a project uh, funded by the Norwegian um, Research Council, a project called the Fragment, Fragile States and Violent Entrepreneurs, and we are very um, pleased with the support uh, that the Norwegian Research Council has uh, given us. The Sahel, not, uh, not very long ago, the Sahel was a region that was only of interest to a few nerds like myself and Francesco and a very select group of uh, researchers. That has changed tremendously. The Sahel has also gone from occupying a very marginal position in international politics to becoming one of the key areas of interest, of geopolitical interest to the European Union and a number of other countries for a number of reasons. It has become increasingly topical because it confronts the international community with um, a series of intertwined challenges and problems. They relate to everything from climate variability, poverty, food insecurity, population displacement, transnational crime, contested statehood, and also jihadi insurgencies. Since the Sahel sort of appeared on the top list of international pol political challenges, a lot has been written about it. And people have sort of come to, at least some observers have come to use this lens of an ungoverned space to portray the Sahel. We believe that this is a flawed picture and also possibly leading to very misguided policies. And part of our reasoning for um, putting this uh, special issue together is to show that governance is not necessarily, that there is not a lack of governance in the, uh, in the Sahel. Rather, what we see is a density of attempts at governing the Sahel, where nobody really comes out of to, uh, on top, but everybody is struggling to try to control at least segments of the population. And this is creating new hybrid orders in the making, which this um, special issue is trying to illustrate and analyze. And the presentations that we will hear today is addressing this from various angles, both from very local studies to those that take a more comprehensive picture of the larger international scene in and around the Sahel. I will leave it at there. Um, I will be available for questions thereafter. Uh, but, uh, but before we start with the first paper that has been written by Kari Uslan and Henriette Ersta, where Kari will present on the fragility dilemma in the Sahel, let me first give the floor for, two, for two, three minutes to my friend uh, Francesco. Thank you very much, Morten. Uh, good afternoon, all of you. My name is uh, Francesco Strazzari. I'm professor of international relations at the PISA-based uh, Santana School of Advanced Studies. My task is just to briefly introduce how this research came about. Morton uh, gave us uh, an idea of the fact that uh, the topicality of the region uh, makes it uh, uh, sometimes uh, difficult or a challenge to find the, the analytical and theoretical angle. Uh, let me just add to that that uh, um, what we try really to do here is to follow the evolution of regional uh, security dynamics from uh, essentially one coup d'etat, the one that uh, um, essentially is referred to as Les Evenements in Mali in 2012, to uh, another coup d'etat that took place uh, 
this year with a bit less of uh, 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 consequences in terms of uh, uh, what is perceived to be uh, uh, the problem in the region. But uh, definitely it, this arc of time and the arc of crisis we try to keep uh, under scrutiny is something throughout, throughout which we developed uh, an attempt uh, to, to deploy a certain uh, method, a method which goes together with grounded theory and with a choice uh, to undergo and undertake a number of uh, research uh, missions to the field. Perhaps something distinctive of the um, research contributions you're going to hear about is that uh, all of us uh, have been uh, uh, going back and forth or staying in the region uh, for periods during, during which uh, we ran interview direct in, uh, observation and uh, a number of reflection and, and insights that are reverberated in an analysis which has as a kind of a, uh, a ground uh, groundwork uh, the, the question of uh, governance uh, governance that we try to to see in a, in a number of uh, ways uh, through the prism of political stability but also through the idea of uh, extra legal structures uh, which uh, are not to be seen only through the eyes of uh, uh, militarization. Uh, the latest news we, we, get, we get from the region is that, uh, for example, uh, the state of Niger, which is considered the bedrock of security, also in terms of international uh, presence in the region, a region that has seen uh, in the last few years, every year, doubling the number of attacks uh, from insurgents. Well, all of that undergoes the, the, the uh, goes through the news that, for example, the state of Niger, one of the poorest in the world, is going to double its uh, uh, um, military, its soldiers' uh, strength. Uh, all of this, of course, raises questions which are in the air when we discuss uh, more complex dynamics of social stratification, eth social stratification, ethno-national uh, um, uh, conflict, and uh, uh, of course uh, the broader issue of state stability. So this is what we try to do when we answer the call that came from the international spectator. Uh, and uh, uh, what we did uh, try to do was to make pairings of researchers. And the first pairing is the one that is run by Kari Uslan that is going to take the floor now. Kari, you have the floor. Uh, Sorry, did you hear me? No, I'll I'll start <laughs> again. Thank you so much, uh, Francesco and Morten, and good afternoon to all of you. It's a great pleasure to be here today, and I'm going to present the main points from the article um, called "The Fragility Dilemma and the Divergent Security Complex in the Sahel," which is written with my good former colleague uh, Henriette Ashta, who I hope is also with us here today. Um, so um, you can move on to the next one, please, uh, Villiers, if you don't mind. OK, while 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 you move on to the next, I will just, I think, uh, start on the first slide um, in the interest of time. As already alluded to by Francesco and Morten, the Sahelian states are characterized as poor and administratively weak, ranked amongst the, among the most fragile in the world. The area is characterized by different forms of instability, especially following the 2011 state collapse in Libya and the 2012 crisis in Mali, and the subsequent spread of violent conflict to neighboring Burkina Faso and Niger, associated with hate and minority issues and a rapid expansion of jihadi insurgencies. In addition, these states are characterized by increased poverty, resource scarcity and climate variability, which have led to more frequent clashes over land rights and access to water, which jihadists have further exploited. So it's against this background that the Central Sahel has been the beneficiary of a growing number of bilateral and multilateral donor assistance programs and external military interventions. If you can click on the next, please. So here, very briefly, you can see an overview of some of the major regional security initiatives in the Sahel. But there are a number of other initiatives going on, as you probably all know. And as one interviewee stated, who does what is the million dollar question, especially in the field of security. And next, please. 
So the main question we ask in this article is the following. Despite an exponential increase in international resources devoted to the Sahel, the situation on the ground continues to deteriorate. How come? And we approached this by looking at two prevalent discourses, violent extremism and irregular migration. Next, please. And just to mention um, that the data for this article is based on fieldwork in Niger in, and Mali in 2019 and Senegal in 2020, as well as data from colleagues who conducted fieldwork in Niger in 2018. So first, the discourse on violent extremism. While regional responses prioritize counterinsurgency operations against global threats, such as the JNIM and the ISGS, the reality on the ground is far more complex. And what these groups have in common, and which also explain their success, is the way in which they tap into local grievances and conflicts, such as those over land, trading, fishing and grazing rights, and into anti-state sentiments, seeking to display state authority and control. Their ability to govern by delivering basic services, such as justice, education, healthcare, and support to those affected by food insecurity and also security where the state fails to do so. And this suggests that the state centric approaches to violent extremism in the region only scratch the surface of a much larger problem. And at worst, they may even be counterproductive. Uh, next, please. And the second discourse is the one on irregular migration. So cross-border mobility and porous borders have long been a source of resilience for Sahelians and thus a key factor in the people-centric security complex. However, the borderlands are also the hotbed of a vast majority of cross-border security challenges, such as terrorism, illicit trafficking and organized crime. And Sahelian governments have received significant support from external actors to strengthen border management, migration governance, which has largely contributed to the securitization of irregular migration. This has di disrupted livelihoods in a region in which sources of income and opportunities for employment are few. Climate change and rain variability make agricultural output unpredictable at a time when seasonal migration, which used to be a safety valve in case of bad crops, is becoming increasingly difficult. Now, unemployment, trafficking and banditry are on the rise. And this very top down implementation of the law has also undermined state legitimacy in, for instance, Agadez, fueling resentment against the government. So next, please. Uh, if you can move to, yeah. So in this article, we argue that there are two main arguments for why it is going from bad to worse, despite more resources. First, this is largely due to what we call this fragility dilemma, which was coined by Morten Bors in 2019. And second, that this fragility dilemma also contributes to an increasing divergence between a state-centric regional and a people-centric transnational security complex. And just to say very briefly that the fragility dilemma that it refers to fragile states which are in critical need of external assistance but which have limited absorption capacity and which are governed by sitting regimes that dictate the terms and upon which external actors must rely. Hence a reverse power relationship between donors and recipients compared to what one may expect. And the notion of a regional security complex was defined by Barry Busan and it is um, uh, pointing to a group of states how primary security concerns link together sufficiently close that their national security cannot realistically be considered apart from one another. And so we look at then the divergence between this state centric regional and the people centric transnational security complex. And this was um, first presented by the UN Economic Commission for Africa in 2017. And while <clears throat> the central Sahelian states and external actors perceive violent extremism and irregular migration as existential security threats and the tools 
used to tackle this are military. The people-centric understanding of these issues is much more complex and broader. Seeing, for instance, migration as a coping mechanism and seeing violent extremism indeed as a security threat, but also as a last resort for people in some instances. And more complex even than that. Next, please. So, um, I, in the interest of time, I see that uh, maybe I will actually jump to the last, um, the last slide. We can go back to some of these, but, but I thought I would just um, finally say something about what this means for the continuation, because um, Morten and, and Francesco asked us to think a little bit as for what this actually means. So, first of all, <coughs> sorry acknowledging the fragility dilemma and the way in which this may increase the divergence between the state and the people's understanding of security and insecurity is important because a continuation of the current situation may make the situation worse. <coughs> I'm sorry. Secondly, it is important to increase state capacity of the Sahelian states. Third, the approach must be much more fine-tuned to the root causes of the problem and people's perception of insecurity, in particular in the case of migration, but also violent extremism. Finally, military means are needed, <clears throat> but also political solutions. I'm sorry for the voice, it's not Corona. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Kari. <laughs> Sorry for your uh, bad throat. I mean, it's it's not. Thank you, Kari. And sorry for um, I'm sorry for your bad throat. I um, hope it soon gets better. After all, it's November and it's not only Corona around here. It's also a lot of colds going on. Uh, I forgot to say that, but please use the, the Q&A for questions um, that you may have to the um, to the various uh, presentations. But uh, right now, in order not to waste more time, let's go straight to uh, to the paper by Laura Berlingosi and Ed Stoddard about counter uh, counterinsurgency practices in Niger and Nigeria. And Laura, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Okay, hello everyone. Thank you so much for organizing this webinar, giving us the possibility to exchange on these timely topics. And thanks to international spectators and editors for putting together such an extraordinary issue. So, uh, within the broader context of understanding dynamics of governance and insurgency in the Sahel, in our contribution, Edward Stoddard and I focused on something that appeared to be somewhat missing in the literature, that is offering a comparative analysis of the counterinsurgency responses to the two East Web Sahelian branches. And I'm sorry, I don't have slides, so you will have to bear with me. So uh, to do that, as counterinsurgency is inevitably linked with insurgency, we examine dynamics between state forces and ISWAP insurgents in Nigeria, Niger, and we specifically use the prism of population support to assess the extent to which a strategic misalignment between insurgency and counterinsurgency practice exists. So the role of uh, population in armed rebellion is a key theme in much of the literature and given the limited time, I will not go over it. In practice, there is no single coin model, but rather a series of different approaches uh, frequently divided between uh, population centric and enemy centric variants, which by no means have to be understood as silos, but rather as a mix. So first we focused on the kind of approach, population approaches of ISWAP Lake Chad operating in Northwest Nigeria and Southeast Niger and ISWAP Greater Sahara, also known as ISGS, operating in the Liptako Gurma region in Niger. What emerged from our analysis is that contrary to the stereotypical understanding of IS strategy, both insurgencies in Nigeria and Niger have sought 
to win hearts and minds of the local population. How did they do that? They have adopted a contractual basis for relations with local communities. I'll give you very few brief examples on that. They increasingly, increasingly carried out large attacks against military posts, such as Shinagodrar and Inatas in Niger, rather than attacking local communities. The very same uh, local communities that at the same time have been increasingly targeted by security and defense forces, thus diminishing their trust on state authorities and augmenting their feelings of frustration and need of protection. They replaced a uh, dysfunctional governance system with an embryo alternative governance system, collecting zakat, administering justice, applying Sharia law, which has been proven to some extent more appealing and impartial than the, than the previous lengthy um, corrupt system. They provided economic alternatives to the marginalized youth, offering a livelihood and forbidden items such as weapons and uh, motorbikes, and they integrated themselves in the local economy. Take, for instance, the Lake Chad area and uh, controlling fish, rice and pepper trade. So these governance dynamics to embed within local communities are still coercive. We are not saying that these are good people, but the population, so the population had really little choice but to confirm. But overall, they have largely used uh, violence against uh, those members of the community who don't follow the rule. Most, uh, mostly the attacks have uh, concerned uh, traditional leaders, local authorities, and those who don't pay the zakat, for example. So these elements point towards um, a framing of the two ISWEPs as using an increasing population-centric insurgency strategy. On the other hand, both Niger and Nigeria coin responses have been broadly conventional, enemy-centric, and highly kinetic, engaged engaging in different operations on the ground. And they also use the strategy of clearance operations, screenings and arrests on one hand, and on the other, control over the economy. So in Nigeria, for example, the military has forced out civilians into garrison towns and military secures IDP camps. And following these clearances and the establishment of these super camps, the population has been screened, oftentimes arrested, and deported to detention centers. In Niger, in the Tilaberi area, the army has emptied several villages. Recent uh, uh, reports have indicated the perpetration of several extrajudicial killings. Then, uh, for a limited time frame, Niger also relied on local ethnic based armed groups uh, such as the Gatia and MSA, which has caused more violence than it prevented, sparkling a violent uh, tit for tat retaliation between uh, the Filani communities, especially the Tolebe, who wanted to protect their communities and the active militias targeting them. Secondly, um, the restriction on the economy has also played into this. Uh, into the link, reinforcing the link between communities and insurgents. In the Lake Chad, the Nigerian government has limited civilian farming, freedom of movement, and shut down markets. In Niger, since 2017, the state has um, put a state of emergency in three regions, Tilaberi, Tawa, and Difa. Uh, imposing a mandatory car fuel, a ban on motorbikes, limitation on the purchase of gas, and imposing a military escort on humanitarian actors. These highly securitized measures have also been used to uh, silence civil society actors and repress civil arrest. So, concluding, uh, these overall security measures have really put a strain on local communities, cutting them off from their livelihood and further alienating them. N Nigeria and Niger have pursued different counterinsurgency models, but they were both 
enemy centric and they have been proven to be both problematic and also strategically self-defeating because they are facing an insurgency which to some extent has put winning hearts and minds at the center of the strategy although i repeat using a coercive means so overall we can say that uh, not only the state strategy is misaligned but it also plays um, it's counter defeating because it intensifies local grievances even more. So some reformulation of coin strategy would be essential, especially putting at the heart of the strategy security and protection for uh, civilians. As for uh, some future developments and in, um, future uh, prospects and improvements, uh, we cannot say that there is a clear shift on site because at the moment uh, Niger is training uh, 12 special forces battalions, is ever more engaged in uh, military operation with Barkan, Operation Almahau, the G5 Sahel Joint Force and the Multinational Joint Task Force. And as uh, uh, Fred Francesco was mentioning in the introduction, um, the, the law in the parliament just passed to double um, the units of the army, passing from uh, 25,000 to 50,000 soldiers. So uh, even if uh, in December, most likely Bazoum uh, will be elected with more than 50% of votes, the idea is that there will be a continuation of this trend. Uh, so uh, keep on focusing on a largely enemy-centric counterinsurgency. And I think my time is up for future developments in Nigeria. You can ask my amazing co-author at Stoddard, which I thank. And I thank, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Laura. And uh, we are having a few problems with connecting to Bernardo Vetturi and uh, Eduardo Baldoro. We are trying to solve that, but in the meantime, uh, we are doing a sort of uh, jump in the queue of uh, presenters. So uh, now we are to uh, turning to my colleague here at NUPI, uh, Alessio Iotri, and uh, his take on political violence on Lake Chad. Please, uh, Alessio, the floor is yours. I will step in. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to the organizer for organizing this. And uh, of course, I consider one, I consider myself one of the organizers. So, okay, this is the the setting of the of the place we, about which we, I will talk about. And um, this is the the, the 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 main focus of my article, which is called uh, the dangers of disconnection. And uh, as you can see, Lake Chad, which is the place we are talking about, is. Uh, inherently a, a transnational space divided between uh, four different countries and uh, as any transnational space uh, it, uh, it it should be tackled as a as a, a transnational and transfrontier uh, trans uh, border area uh, which needs to um, to be unpacked through uh, um, an approach devoted to circulation and this is this is why I also uh, focused uh, on uh, on the kind of governance that is what, uh, which is the Islamic State West Africa province, which was mentioned by my great colleague uh, Laura, which just talked, and um, and uh, there and I will focus on uh, on the Iswap uh, or Daula uh, group, which is operating on the Chadian side of uh, of the Lake Chad, which is of course the the eastern part of the lake. And uh, as you can see from the map, uh, the, the circulation is at stake when we are talking about this kind of uh, of governance. And uh, and uh, I we, I will mention even though we don't have the time to go in deep with with this kind of uh, of uh, thinking, uh, regimes of connectivity. Regis, regimes of connectivity are the frames that I use to understand um, the development of phenomena of phenomena uh, of um, uh, roaming. Uh, uh, violence in uh, in and around Lake Chad, because this is deeply connected with the with the nature of the economy in the space, which is mostly informalized, which means that it, it doesn't doesn't follow the strict regulations and bureaucracy of the of the each of the states that uh, that uh, uh, have their shores on the lake, 
but are uh, indeed informalized and they take place in a sort of um, um, not a vacuum, but indeed a space which has plenty of regulations, which are actually norms because they are not written, they are just oral. And, uh, and the kind of smuggling and trafficking activities uh, that of course take place in this, uh, in this uh, lecture space are connected mostly to, uh, to the smuggling of cattle, of uh, dried fish like uh, the banda, or, uh, or the red gold, the red pepper, which is uh, one of the more foremost uh, agricultural exports of the area. And uh, of course, this kind of economy uh, is only alive and uh, is only animated uh, by the, the, the several groups of brokers and middlemen that are present in, uh, in several of the local markets in, in, within Lake Chad, in the inner areas of the lake, or in the, uh, in the nearby markets. Uh, and we can go as far as to Maiduguri or, uh, or even Damaturu in Yobe State, or uh, of course in Gimi in Niger. And um, these kind of brokers and middlemen are not coherently part of the Boko Haram project or the ISWAP project. They are, they are rather indirectly involved in this kind of economy. And of course, they, they allow the existence of these um, uh, networks to exist. And as long as they allow the existence of these networks, ISWAP or Boko Haram will be able to uh, go deep and uh, hijack this kind of, of, of networks and survive thereon. So the main question, because I guess that maybe I don't have so much time and I should be <laughs> tight, uh, is that um, what kind of governance do we have in Lake Chad then? Because uh, we know that even in this, this big best uh, inland sea, uh, there is not just one group uh, operating there. It's not, it's not just uh, Daula or Iswap operating there. There is also the, the infamous Bakura group, which is, we know, connected to, to, to the leadership of Abu Bakr Sheka, which is operating far south in the, in the, in the forests of Sambisa and northern Cameroon, in the Waza National Park. So it's, 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 it's a kind of governance which is, which is not uh, coherent or organic, but of course it... Uh, it is connected to it. And um, while uh, the, uh, trying to reply to the first question, we say that uh, is there a kind of governance? Yes and no, because yes, we have, uh, we have several groups that levy taxes, but we also have uh, a kind of physical presence which is not properly sovereign and it's limited to madrasa camps, training camps or storage camps, uh, which are scattered on the various uh, islands of the um, Lake Chad archipelago or the Bol archipelago. But uh, so uh, we cannot but uh, be unsure uh, in, uh, in, in defining this kind of uh, unsettled uh, um, space and uh, unsettled regime, which is uh, dominating this kind of space. And uh, this connects us to, to what happened um, very recently in, uh, in the location of Zabarmari, which is in very close to Maiduguri, so the capital city of, of Borno State in Nigeria. And uh, the Zabarmari massacre, which the UN claimed was uh, 110 persons uh, as, um, as, uh, as, uh, as victims, is in that, uh, luckily enough, the, 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 the victims are much less. Uh, there are sort of 40, 45 people, and uh, this connects to the different way in which uh, the Abu Bakr Shekau led group uh, is asserting this kind of governance. Because on the mainland, the thing, the things changes. So in the in, in the matter of few kilometers, uh, we see a kind of governance which is not properly sovereign. And in the in the in the northern part of Borno State, we see inst instead. The kind of governance which is, uh, of course, violent and, uh, of course, murderous, and uh, and uh, and it's based mostly on the um, um, organization of checkpoints in uh, on the main alleys and the main highways. But uh, maybe with my uh, colleague Ed Stoddard, that we will we will uh, talk about it later. And uh, I guess that my time is running out, so uh, I will step over and. Uh, and give space to the next. <laughs> Thanks a lot. That would be Luca. That would be Luca. <laughs> right, okay, good afternoon. Shall I just go or? Just go, Luca. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, 
I'm realizing again that I cannot unfortunately upload my slides, but I sent it to you. So if you can upload them for me. <coughs> in the meantime, I can perhaps start already uh, in the interest of time. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much to Noob for organizing this and to International Spectator for hosting our uh, special issue, to which I contribute with an article on gold mining in the Sahara Sahel, the political geography of state making and unmaking. Um, so as some of you may know, uh, gold mining is one of the most important economic resources uh, in the Sahel, and it has become even more important recently due to the discovery of a very rich gold vein stretching across the Sahara from, from uh, east to west. It has been discovered in 2012 due to a combination of high international prices and cheap economies made available by uh, transnational networks, which has led to the discovery of hundreds uh, and thousands of gold mining sites in uh, central Sahel. Uh, it is, um, it is um, considered that the aggregate economic value of these resources of gold mining in the region is higher than that of other uh, type of econom informal economic activities, which are, however, much more um, uh, much more discussed and debated, probably due to their uh, higher politicization. Uh, in other words, uh, the aggregate economic value of gold mining is higher than that of drug smuggling or migrant smuggling in uh, the region, and probably even higher of uh, the gold that is smuggled out of other regions, which has which have received a much greater media coverage, such as the Great Lakes uh, region. Uh, so, if we can move now to the next slide. Yes, thank you very much. The question that this raises is whether uh, the discovery and the recent boom of artisanal gold mining in the region is more likely to fuel state disruption or rather state building. Uh, it is important to note that both these uh, hypotheses are well rooted in the available scientific literature. On the one hand, there is the whole literature on conflict resources from conflict diamonds or blood diamonds on, uh, which stresses that even irrespective of one's individual motivation, uh, fragile states provide an opportunity structure that enables uh, the disruption of state, that enable conflicts in the presence of lootable resources. Now, we know that artisanal gold mining provides a highly lootable, highly valuable resource, and we know that the Sahel uh, is a region characterized by fragility under almost any possible respect. That means that in this case, artisanal gold mining in the Sahel provides a most likely case for this conflict resource theory to hold. And indeed, a variety of mechanisms can, can explain this hypothesis in the sense that the revenues of artisanal gold mining uh, can be hypothesized as uh, used for uh, to fund rebel or jihadist groups, uh, but also provide uh, resources for conflict, for banditry and protection rackets on the other hand, but also uh, fuel money laundering for organized crime. However, on the other hand, it is possible to hypothesize that uh, the resource capture fostered by neo-patrimonial networks supports uh, co-option and leads eventually to stabilization. After all, uh, historical sociology puts forward the idea that protection and extraction should be interpreted or could be interpreted as precursors of state formation. And again, there is a variety of elements that lend credibility to this second hypothesis, uh, not least the fact that gold mining already represents the most important source of income of exports and of hard currency of all Sahelian states, uh, that um, gold mining uh, provides a staggering 10% uh, of uh, jobs, both directly and indirectly, to the population uh, living in the Sahelian region, and that those jobs uh, and the uh, revenues of such jobs uh, are likely to drain the push factors of uh, dynamics often linked to destabilization, such as irregular migration 
and jihadist mobilization. So both uh, options, both theories are, are very likely to occur in the Sahelian uh, context. If you move to the next slide, um, we can see how I try to interpret this uh, dichotomy. I'm not sure whether you're seeing the next slide. Yes. Um, I am I, trying to focus on uh, the limited regulation that uh, revolves around artisanal gold mining by definition, but also on the poor law enforcement that characterize fragile states such as the one that we found in the Sahel. And in my article, I focus in particular on the interactions between state and non-state actors in the delivery of protection of gold mining sites. Uh, now, this interaction uh, can fall theoretically somewhere between the notion of hybrid security institutions or mafia style state sponsored protection rackets uh, managed by violent entrepreneurs. Both these perspectives acknowledge that in the context, in contexts such as the Sahel, these interactions uh, can range from cooperation to competition. And the aim of my research is to try and single out the factors that make such interactions veer in one direction or another. So the interpretation that I try to put forward is that um, geography intended not a, 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 a deter a, a, uh, in deterministic sense, but rather as socially constructed, uh, contributes to explaining whether artisanal gold mining leads towards state building or state disruption. And in my analysis, I divide the region up into three clusters uh, that are endowed with similar governance and security characteristics, the Sahel, the Sahara, and the Tibesti. Now, the characteristics of these uh, different clusters are, are described in the next slide, where very briefly, I uh, try to show that in the Sahel, that comprises the southern part of Mali and Niger and the whole of Burkina Faso, protection is usually provided for by networks of vigilante groups that are tied to political elites in, in the capitals, uh, typically the dozo, the, the confraternities of traditional hunters. And this leads to a situation of mutual profitability in, the maintain, in, in, in maintaining the stability of uh, artisanal gold mining. That is to say, uh, the, the, the strengthening of the hybrid order in the region. The situation is very different in the Sahara, uh, in the Saharan region of Mali and Niger, where the control of uh, local uh, state elites based in the capital is much shallower. So here in the Sahara, central state authorities have reportedly tried to shut down artisanal gold mining activity, motivated by fears that gold mining revenues could escape state oversight and boost the separatist insurgency or enrich criminal networks and fuel arms smuggling. However, in the end, both Niger and Mali state authorities eventually realized that clamping down on artisanal gold mining in the Sahara could have prompted an escalation of the already high tension with the Tuareg communities. While conversely, artisanal gold mining could have, and indeed has, absorbed ro local rebellious youths, driving their attention away from dangerous temptation. So the result is that we see uh, local Tuareg groups, including rebels in Mali or former rebels in Niger, that are tolerated by the state as providers of security in these, uh, in these gold mining sites. And this uh, arrangement supports a fragile peace between these uh, state and non-state actors. Uh, the last cluster is the one that we meet in, in the Tibesti, uh, which includes gold mining sites in the north of Chad, but also some of them in uh, the northeast of, uh, of Niger. Here, I think it's important to highlight Tibesti's proximity to Libya, which has undermined Sahelian state authorities' capacity to implement an even informal or shadow form of regulation on local actors. Because here, local actors gravitate around different, uh, a different center, uh, political and economic center, which have, has increased the distance from Sahelian capitals. Uh, for instance, Libya-based violent entrepreneurs of Tebu origins are claimed to be behind the provision of protection in Tibesti's artisanal gold mining sites. By the way, Libya's pull factors has made itself felt not only on the provision of protection, but also on the provision of capital 
uh, and labor. The best gold mining sites are in fact located along the major migratory routes connecting sub-Saharan Africa to Libya and possibly to Europe. So this has fueled the fear that artisanal gold mining could boost or hide northbound irregular migration, leading to a convergence of interest between local state actors and their international donor. The result has been the closure of gold mining sites in the region with uh, evictions, massive evictions of thousands of gold miners, leading obviously to conflict and the militarization of the area. Uh, jumping now to the conclusion to the last slide. Thank you very much. Um, I think that uh, this spatial analysis provides a valuable uh, interpretive tool to understand the variability in the governance of artisanal gold mining sites in the Sahara Sahel. There is some consistency, in fact, in how uh, artisanal gold mining is regulated in the Sahel, where state authorities tend to subcontract artisanal gold mining to, um, to uh, non-state actors that are tied to power networks. Uh, in the Sahara, where state authorities uh, eventually tolerate or negotiate uh, the control and the provision of protection on gold mining sites with uh, potential rebels that are therefore co-opted somehow into, uh, into state uh, power networks. And in the Tibesti, where state authorities have, uh, have adopted a much harsher strategy preventing and suppressing artisanal gold mining activities uh, in the region. So uh, this leads to the conclusion that social geographical proximity is indeed a good predictor of whether artisanal gold mining fuels state disruption or hybrid state construction. Um, in conclusion, I would like to say, however, that proximity and distance are um, cannot that sorry that artisanal gold mining per se cannot undo the root causes of state fragility in the Sahel, at least as long as violent entrepreneurs are there to harvest widespread grievances against the exclusionary practices that are inherent in patronage networks. And with this, I finish and thank you very much for your attention. I'm ready to elaborate further during the uh, Q&A. Uh, this is uh, this paper that I've written together with uh, my uh, dear colleagues uh, Abdul Wahab Sisse and Lauli Maman. It's based on joint uh, work that we have been doing in uh, Niger and particularly in the Tilaberi region, um, where we are trying to basically explain why a region like Tilaberi so quickly has unraveled into violence. And it's not necessarily uncommon that the regions in the Sahel unravels into violence and that it can happen quite quickly. But uh, and Tilabre is uh, like many other regions, uh, conflict prone regions of the Sahel. It is uh, a border region. But on the contrary to other border regions, for example, in the three border area between Mali, Niger and Burkina Faso, it is not a remote region. It is in fact um, very close to the, to the capital area, no more than 60 kilometers. So what we are trying to do is then to come up with some ideas, some hypotheses about how this has happened. It, uh, as I said, the region of Tilabri has quickly lapsed into a state of violence and come under control of what we call violent entrepreneurs. That is non-state armed actors possessing some kind of political agenda, which is implementing it in tandem with different types of income generating activities. So we use this in order to make a distinction between pure banditry. There is a political agenda here, but it also often is combined in tandem with different types of income generating activities. These actors rule through force and violence but they also distribute resources, provide some level of order and offer protection to at least parts of the population in their areas they control or attempt to control. Next slide, please. So why has this happened so close to Niamey? Looking at the literature, we come up with three different explanations, three competing hypotheses, if you like. One is that this basically is about spillover effects from the war in Mali. Secondly, that this is all due to 
a numerous local herder farmer conflicts that has sort of been lifted up to a higher conflict level. Or thirdly, this is more to do with the ability of jihadi insurgents to appropriate local grievances and the failure of the state, in this case, the Nigerian state, to resist this. Next, please. Next, please. If we start with the first one, spillover from Mali. If this is the case, this is a neighborhood effect that increases the risk of violent conflict in proximate states. If this is the case, Mali is the black hole of the region into which weak neighboring countries implode. So then this would be the case both for Niger and for Burkina Faso. The idea of regional implosion is worth examining, but this hypothesis does not amount to much more than a description of what has happened. Simply that insurgents spill over border because they can, and neighboring countries are too weak to resist. In our point of view, this is it's part of the explanation, but it's not uh, sufficient to explain exactly what has happened in Tel Aviv. Next slide, please. The second uh, possible factor is farmer herder conflicts. And farmer herder conflicts in Tel Aviv has a long history, as the region is a center for cattle breeding and the transhumance in Niger. And if you look closely into the pattern of farmer herder conflicts here, and also farmer farmer conflicts and herder herder conflicts, it offers some insights into how a region, while never entirely peaceful, has unraveled so quickly into violence. For example, the tit for tat cattle raiding between uh, um, communities of Tuareg origin and communities of Fulani origin. However, for this to make sense, we also need to understand how the weakness and dysfunctionality of the state imply that the sovereign power that is supposed to regulate such conflict has, if not disappeared, become, become one among many actors who seek to govern in return for local support and profit. And this leads us to the third hypothesis and the next slide, please. What makes this possible is what we call armed actors authority. This will differ in form, reach, effectivity and legitimacy. From rooming loot and plunder to stationary forms of more systematically service provision and crude tax collection. In between these two old established forms of banditry and of insurgency originally uh, developed by Mankir uh, Olsen. We believe that there exist more flexible forms, what we call sporadic governance. And this is, in our point of view, very much the preferred strategy of the main insurgency uh, that has been active in Tel Aviv over the last couple of years, and that is the, the so-called Islamic State Greater Sahara. And what it, is, what it displays is a type of model governance that comes and goes where the ISDS do not attempt to gain more ter permanent territorial control, but social control of a targeted population through a combination of unpredictable coercive activities and sporadically offer some governance services. And this is in fact a very cheap way to try to control uh, certain populations. Instead of sort of trying to gain permanent territorial control, which is costly seen from an insurgent point of view. Achieving this more sporadic governance is something that you in fact can achieve on a, uh, on a shoestring budget if your opponent is not able to achieve much more than you can achieve yourself. Next slide, please. So what this is all about is the ability of an insurgency like the ISGS and other insurgencies in the Sahel to appropriate local grievances. And by this we mean their ability to make use of local cleavages as land rights conflicts or disputes over trading rights in order to further their integration into local communities. Or alternatively, which is also taking place here, attacking state institutions and practices 
that from a local community uh, perspective was seen as corrupted and dysfunctional even before the conflict started or which we have seen quite a lot when it comes to the ISGS integration into local Fulani communities, offering protection against cattle riding. And even establishing some rudimentary court systems. Next slide, please. What this means is that in an enabling environment as Tilaberi, you can in fact govern on a shoestring. Offer people an alternative when none really exists. For example, also here we have seen an introduction of what we may call mobile courts by the Islamic uh, insurgencies. And people tend to say that at least a considerable part of the affected population tend to think that this is just like the state, but it works. It is harsh and violent justice, but this justice cannot be bought and it's instant. Decisions are taken and implemented. And this is not something that people are used to by in local state courts. This means that you can govern on a shoestring budget if there is no other credible alternatives and your approach is that of a governance that comes and goes type that combines unpredictable coercive activities. For example, violence with some service provision when both activities are dressed up in a pious religious political language. Final slide, please. So what this suggests is in main is also the Janus phase of state responses. And a concern in this regard is the anti-terrorist operation uh, Turbillion, led by the Nigerian security forces, which has created collateral damage. This was also alluded to by Laura and Ed in uh, their paper and in Laura's presentation. It's created collateral damage that is exploited by the ISDS to turn local communities, if not against the state, at least away from it. In this regard, it's positive that the state of Niger recently has started to evaluate its national strategy for the prevention and fight against um, violent extremism with the assistance of many partners, such as the European Union, USAID and the Organization of the Islamic Community. And in this regard, it's noteworthy that Niger hosted the OEC Ministerial Conference on November 27. If Niger succeed in this, it will enhance the resilience of the state, but it remains to be seen. And I forgot that I had one more slide. Okay. So for finally, some conclu concluding comments. What characterizes what characterize the social space of uh, Tilabre, Tilaberi is not the lack of governance per se, as the ungoverned space arguments claim but the density of actors locked into a violent competition to introduce alternative orders that cannot easily be reconciled. Those, what, is, what we're seeing here is not an embryonic hegemonic order, but permanent competition where neither insurgents nor state actors and their international supporters are able to move, move much beyond the governance that comes and goes. In this regard, the governance on offer by international community actors share many similarities with those offered by an insurgency as the ISGC. Just as the ISDS, the Nigerian state forces and their external allies are unfortunately at the time being just an, or, or just an other order provider that comes and goes. Uh, Francesco? Well, yes, no, I, I just wanted to say a word about uh, the, the contribution by Baldaro and Dial that is an attempt to delve into the so-called end of the Sahel exception, that is uh, the, the beginning starting from uh, a few months ago of uh, an acrimonious dispute that uh, ended up in open combat between uh, uh, Al-Qaeda affiliated uh, uh, Kataib, that is mainly the Katiba Masina, and on the other hand, uh, the, the Islamic State in the greater uh, Sahara, uh, in the inner Niger Delta especially, and that's uh, something that has attracted uh, a lot of attention. So what uh, uh, we try to do in the, in the issue is to look into the patterns of violence and how uh, the Islamic State through uh, um, its uh, local agent that is uh, ISGS uh, is, is trying to uh, challenge basically the, the local hegemony and nice. to recruit from, uh, from the ranks uh, of the Katiba Masina that is the traditional hegemony in the, in the area 
starting with the question of material and immaterial resources. Uh, this is a very much uh, ongoing uh, uh, dynamic. And the other article that we are missing due to technical reasons is the, a contribution. Once again, let me signal this because we really try to do partnership between uh, local researchers and uh, uh, international researchers. That is, uh, we try to avoid also the, the classical idea that you know the local researchers do the data uh, digging and the international researcher does the rumination of that. No, we, all, all of our articles are based on a true uh, research partnership uh, face by face. And uh, Bernardo Venturi and uh, Nana Torre uh, are, are working on uh, what they term the great illusion that is how security sector reforms technically defined in the case of Mali, in spite of so much uh, uh, insistence and emphasis uh, has been giving uh, disappointing uh, outcomes, uh, both with an analysis that stretches from Burkina Faso and, uh, and Mali, uh, looking into questions of abuses, violation, corruption in the army, and uh, the relevance of uh, the significance of uh, non-armed state groups, uh, non-armed groups and proxies, and how sometimes uh, uh, technical definition fail to address uh, the broader picture. All in all, I think, Morten, we can say that uh, the, the, the gist, uh, or let's say the direction of all of this is actually something we tried to sum up in the title of the special issue, that is, we look at the making and unmaking of a regional order uh, through, that is something your analysis uh, uh, on the Tilaberi region uh, illustrates quite eloquently, uh, through uh, uh, both uh, what happens uh, on the ground and in its interaction with international and regional uh, counterinsurgency uh, and uh, international assistance uh, strategies. Uh, so it's on both sides and by looking at the interaction and not by understanding a problem out there and the remedy uh, down here, that we understand how uh, the region is one where a number of political projects that are not only the one based on the traditional, let's say, Westphalian prototypical idea of state, but other forms of claim over territory, other forms of political allegiance and, and uh, solidarity are being uh, uh, um, mixed uh, with outcomes that are yet uh, unfolding uh, and that we try to detect and to somehow to, to give uh, in a way that uh, makes sense from an analytical and theoretical point of view. I don't know more. There is a question that I would like to pose to all the um... Uh, all, all the authors, and then I would urge uh, people to ask questions while I give uh, um, the different uh, presenters uh, a minute or two to respond to the following question. With more international actors engaging, French hege hegemony is challenged. Is this a blessing or a challenge in terms of addressing the fragility dilemma? And if any of the two, in what ways are, are they blessing or a challenge? So I think we can start in the order that we uh, proceeded. Uh, so Kari, would you like to try to give your thoughts on this uh, question, please? I, or, and, and also perhaps, are we in fact seeing an end to French hegemony in the Sahel? I'm personally, it's not utterly certain that that is the case. But Kari, please. OK, thank you so much. Um, now I should, of course, had had I had wanted to, to leave the floor to Henriette Ashta, but I, I saw that she couldn't she she wasn't able to join us either. So so then I'll go ahead and uh, I don't have a simple answer um, to that question, but let me offer a few reflections. Uh, so first of all, more actors. I mean, if it is the case, more actors often implies less coordination. <laughs> I mean, despite all the coordinating bodies present, because as we know, everybody wants more coordination, but no one wants to be coordinated. So what is needed is, is of course, better coordination, but that's easier said than done. Um, another point, I think, is that, you know, more actors on the donor side might uh, serve as a multiplying factor, perhaps, on the second part of the fragility dilemma, namely the invert power relationship between the donors and the recipient. Uh, I mean, given the recipients even more power because they can play the, the donors out, so to speak, or they can, you know, they can, yeah, they can play them around. So, um, and, and a third point perhaps, um, I don't know, but I we see that the current stabilization strategy by external actors 
uh, is undermining uh, local coping strategies. Um, whether that would make a difference if, if uh, the French were to a certain extent um, more challenged as for their he hegemony, um, I'm uncertain, but I'll leave that to, to the rest of this excellent panel to, to answer. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Kari. And I mean, we are now showing how complete amateurs we are with. Uh, I don't think we should try to run a TV channel, to put it that way. <laughs> uh, hopefully, we, uh, the, our intellectual contributions are larger than our technical contributions right now. I'm so sorry about it. Uh, um, these technical uh, issues has uh, sort of turned uh, everything uh, upside down here and we have been struggling with it ever since. Um, but thanks, Kari. And I would also like to sort of try to say to people that the Q&A is still open, so it's still possible to ask uh, questions. Um, Laura, the floor is yours, uh, please. Thank you very much. And uh, maybe you should run a radio program, but because everything worked well audio wise, so no worries. I just want to add maybe a couple of points on um, this uh, end of uh, French hegemony, thinking about the latest uh, events that happened in Mali and what has been the whole debate around the issue of, for example, talking with the bad guys, so negotiating with jihadists, a process that was started during Ibeka and possibly is also continuing during um, this transitional period. And we have seen a French opposition to that. So that puts a little bit the question on the extent to which um, a little bit of, of a shadow on Malian sovereignty uh, overall, because um, Mm, from many parts, many policymakers, Western partners, uh, some Western partners have also called for the resumption of negotiation with, uh, with some armed groups, which uh, possibly is part of the solution, but we see that French are uh, really against that. On the other hand, we have had um, a push also after the Paul meeting, uh, from uh, Macron, in a sense, to um, sharing the burden with uh, with the EU member states, uh, pushing for a Takuba operation to be uh, shared with the EU partners, but still the whole operation remains very much French, as uh, in terms of uh, in mm, in terms of coordination. And um, also this kind of sharing the burden with, with other EU members is not working uh, perfectly because it still remains uh, kind of under the umbrella of, uh, of Bakan. Another issue uh, with this is linked with the idea that um, we, the, um, there is a discourse around pushing on uh, local ownership and mostly African solutions, so uh, everything that is within uh, ECOWAS, the African Union, and sharing the burden, which should be uh, much more localized in uh, local efforts. But on the other hand, we see a multiplication of, uh, of uh, big umbrellas like uh, Alliance Sahel, uh, Coalition pour les Sahel, a whole, um, so by trying to uh, have less actor and trying to push for more coordination, actually the action that is taking is to multiply these different platforms, which in a way or in another are still very much French led. So um, I don't know, this is uh, my point. Thank you, Laura. Uh, very interesting. And then I think we turn to um, Alessio. For the same question about French hegemony challenged or... Uh, okay, uh, so the point is that, of course, as, uh, as, as both Kari and Laura have just said, the, the, the frame is still overwhelming, overwhelmingly 
uh, occupied by French in uh, West Africa and the Sahara and the Sahara in general. But uh, of course, uh, to, I don't see this challenge coming in massive terms, let's say, that, uh, that there is a multiplication of actors which are progressively more engaged in what take, takes place in the Sahara and the Sahel. This is for sure. And uh, as we can see, with uh, this is a blessing, uh, at least for local governments, to multiply their, their different um, uh, financial dependencies or relationship to other countries. And uh, of course, uh, this helps some kind of regimes to 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 stay in the place and uh, to keep their uh, their seats actually. But uh, the the main question is that uh, in the in the long term, I I do not see uh, a, an actual challenge to this kind of French hegemony. Uh, as long as the, the main contender in the in global terms, uh, I mean, I mean, China or Russia are not uh, um, stepping in in, uh, in in more concrete ways, at least uh, as as French, which is the non-local, non-indigenous power, which has the more most lasting experience and relationship to the region. And I think we I will stop here. Thank you, Alessio. Luca, do you want to come in on this one? <clears throat> I can very briefly uh, perhaps reiterate what previous speakers have already mentioned, which is to say that I, I, I don't see uh, a concrete challenge uh, coming to the French hegemony in the area in these days. Uh, we should uh, be aware of the fact that many of the international actors that are stepping in to the, uh, the the Sahelian theater are being encouraged to do so by France. Uh, Saudi Arabia, Emirates, which are major contributors to the G5 Sahel, have been strongly encouraged by France to, to, to become partner to this uh, framework of alliance that uh, is, is economically unsustainable. And, and the French themselves are, are trying as much as they can to multilateralize it so as to share the economic burden. And the same can be said perhaps for Morocco, which has an independent uh, economic and political agenda that is fostered by uh, transnational networks, some of them linked to, to, to the king. Uh, but in the same way, uh, Morocco contributes to uh, training programs targeting imam in some form of moderate Islam, which is very much encouraged and welcomed by, by the French, is the so-called recette marocaine. So many of the most important players beyond uh, France and beyond Europe are nowadays uh, intervening, I would say, under uh, the, the, the frame and the hegemony, perhaps, of, of France. We certainly don't see in the Sahel the same type of geopolitical competition that we see elsewhere in Africa, such as in North of Africa or in the Horn. Thanks. Uh... Thanks, Luca. Um, we have a couple of more questions, and some of them uh, goes to you. So I'll give you another an additional three minutes to tackle them, and then we have some uh, final questions that I would like to pose to uh, to uh, to all the presenters. But uh, we have one from uh, Vladimir uh, on uh, to what extent the booming of informal gold mining in the Sahel is changing EU-sponsored border controls uh, control operations in Niger. How, it, how is it transforming the relationship between Niamey and state-sponsored protection rackets operating in the realm of migration? And then there is a comment question from um, uh, a Norwegian colleague, Kjetil Fred Hansen, uh, who has been working in and with Chad for close to 20 years, but has never managed to go to Tibet due to security situation and or uh, restrictions from the DB regime. What are the sources used in your article concerning uh, Tibesti? So if you take uh, three, four minutes on uh, those two questions, Luca, and then we I'll uh, have some final uh, questions for the whole uh, panel. Sure. Luca, please. I'll pick up the second one first, uh, which is easier to, 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 to respond to, uh, because I, I, um, I'm, I'm very, uh, I, I need to disclose very openly that I did not do field work in the Tibesti area. Uh, there, there was no, it was impossible for me to do so. So I managed to interview some people from the Tibesti or who worked in the Tibesti, who spent time as gold miners in the Tibesti, that I managed to meet 
in a variety of meetings uh, that, uh, that uh, I was able to organize throughout the region in Niger, in the north of Niger, but also in Tunisia, but also Libyans that managed to come to Tunisia or indirectly. And then I, I essentially relied on existing uh, uh, literature, that is to say reports written by some of the, the few authors I'm aware of who have been able to actually carry out fieldwork in the region, uh, Jérôme Tubiana, Stefano Gramizzi and others. Um, whereas when the first, uh, for, as for the first question, um, it, it's a very interesting question. I think that the closure of, uh, when we speak of gold mining in the north of Niger, we are essentially dealing with three main uh, groups or clusters of gold mines, Chibarakaten, Tabelot and Jado. Jado is the only one who has been closed and that has probably to do also with fears that it could fuel um, irregular migration as a stopover uh, towards Libya. Uh, but I think that the most important fears were related to the overall security and insecurity with rumors that uh, gold mining was being performed and carried out by uh, roaming armed groups, some of them coming from Chad, some of them coming from Libya, which could have uh, actually uh, undermined the, the security in the region. Uh, that didn't, and, and that is also linked to the fact that those controlling the Jado are, are Tebu, and Tebu are perhaps less well integrated than the Tuareg in the uh, bureaucratic machinery of the state of Niger. Uh, the Tuareg are very well integrated, and therefore they managed to negotiate uh, the, the, the opening of uh, some of the gold mining sites that they keep um, under control, essentially because it's based in their traditional area in the Ayer Mountains or in Chibarakaten towards the, the border with Algeria. So it has less to do with the trajectory of migrants, but at the same time it has helped reabsorb many of, uh, former, many of those who were formerly involved in, in smuggling of uh, migrants or in, or in uh, facilitating the journey of migrants uh, north uh, northward. Um, many former smugglers are now either uh, gold miners themselves or ship people from essentially Agadez to uh, these gold mining towns which have boomed all around uh, gold mining sites. Uh, so I think this managed somehow to, to keep a balance and to maintain some sort of security in the region of Agadez where tensions were, were uh, very, very high, uh, considering the several economic backlashes suffered by the region from, uh, from, from the fall of the price of uranium to the disruption of uh, the smuggling economy linked to, uh, to uh, migration, but also uh, the... the, the, the climatic, uh, uh, the, the environmental factors that are eroding the um, uh, local livelihoods. So all these reasons converge, in my opinion, to saying that essentially there was an agreement to tolerate uh, gold mining in the region that was sort of a lesser evil as compared to the danger of, uh, of uh, fueling uh, radicalization in, in uh, the area of the Jado or fueling international migration. Thank you, Luca. Uh, we have a few more sort of relatively broad questions that I would like to pose uh, to the panel. Um, they concern uh, the density of actors in the region, uh, the, um, the difficulty of coordination, how we could solve the coordination problem. Uh, is it possible that some actors may step back to allow others to be more present and presumably more effective? Is this likely to happen? And also, where can we find even still unrealizable hopes for the future of the Sahel region? So maybe we could sort of end by trying to tackle them. And maybe, uh, Francesco, if you'd like to say something towards the end, I have a few comments that uh, I also would like to make. But um, we still have some time, so it's also possible to pose uh, one, or, uh, one or two more questions. But first, um, let's go back to, to Kari. What's the future of the Sahel and what's the future of coordination? Oh, that's a very difficult question. I cannot answer that. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, um, I think, I mean, the governance, the the kind of relationship between um, uh, the donors uh, and those on the security side, the aid um, on the aid side and the recipients 
it is some kind of a black box. And I think we need we need uh, more research in order to understand that. Um, and but I do think that the fragility dilemma do point to some uh, weaknesses in the current setup, which I think is a starting point, at least in order to try to to come to grips with it and, and try to avoid uh, the uh, unintended negative consequences. Um, and just to mention that uh, in our article, um, we, we, we come with a few examples of what seem to be uh, promising um, external initiatives. And, and one of them is the uh, localization strategy, uh, which has been implemented by the Belgian Special Forces in Niger. And I'm, I'm just mentioning it because I do think that uh, the way that they have done it, uh, where, where the people working on it are also deployed for a long time, um, is, is a good example of something that could work. But anyhow, I, uh, I think uh, for the rest it would be a lot of speculation, so I would I will leave that to you. Thank you so much. Laura, uh, are you ready to uh, speculate about the future of the Sahel? <laughs> <laughs> yes, as uh, these times are not uncertain enough, <laughs> I have a, a bull where I can see the future of the Sahel. No, um, what I can add to the conversation maybe is that in a time when uh, the EU is um, redrafting uh, its Sahelian strategy that now uh, um, it's, uh, it's outdated, it's from 2011, so there has been a lot of discussion going on on how to improve um, the also EU intervention uh, in the region. The idea is, of course, to try to have a more coordinated uh, intervention uh, with closer cooperation with the G5 Sahel that so far um, many say that has not uh, achieved great results. So having a Sahelian co coalition uh, with, um, with a clearer uh, strategy in the region with more uh, with partners that collaborate and are more coordinated on the ground. The reality is I, I, I I feel like this is a um, it's probably wishful thinking because of course uh, there are different uh, different actors with different interests, different agendas, different economic and strategic interests in the region. So um, also this uh, um, the, the discourse around CT and uh, PCV, agendas and strategies which are a sort of uh, uh, cloud, uh, sort of uh, blurry uh, conceptualization of uh, which sometimes the, the lines between uh, these programs on the ground to bring stability are really, uh, are, are really blurry. And um, how can we solve the issue? When, well, one part of the answer, which I think will be brought up also in the new EU Sahel strategy, will be more local ownership. And also, Kari was referring to the uh, Belgian Special Force uh, localization strategy. So more local ownership of, uh, of the population. Then we also have to uh, reflect on the kind of actions that are brought to the fore and uh, in uh, most of the research done so far, uh, looking at the shortcomings that uh, have happened so far, point into the direction that the um, international actions should be reframed within the context of really ensuring more protection, security, to local population and also kind of rebalancing this de development and security nexus uh, strategy. The, um, the, if the, the approach so far has really been linked with this, then uh, with the security and development nexus in practice, it has been way too much security and way too little development. Thank you, Laura. Uh, 
then I think we turn to Alessio and then to Luca. Yes. Yes, uh, but replying to these questions, which is somehow related also to the other questions which are coming by. Uh, the point is that we are here, we are not trying to engineer new solutions because I think that too many solutions have been already engineered in this uh, space, which is, of course, uh, a colonial space. So it's it's like more than a century that it's uh, the target of a new engineering solution or social engineering solution. So, I would like to stress that maybe, yes, as uh, so someone in the questions pointed out or mentioned briefly, is that uh, maybe uh, some actors should step out of this uh, this frame and uh, this would allow for a better coordination of the efforts and a better coordination also of the kind of relationship that uh, the West as a, as a global donor, let's say, w w uh, aims to build with, uh, with local regimes, with the indigenous regimes, and uh, which are very different in nature and uh, which are, uh, of course, uh, present different futures in terms of governance and the actual control of the territory. So um, one other, uh, one, uh, another thing that I would like to stress in relationship to all these questions is that um, yes, the, indeed many, many uh, non-state armed groups which are operating on the ground are able to offer more, more viable governance solutions, but uh, they have a very different agenda and a very different kind of legitimacy uh, compared to those claimed by uh, the national state uh, or the post-colonial national states in the in West Africa and the Sahel. So the kind of uh, of uh, allowing them to to keep on and uh, and resist and uh, and maybe also expand as many of these groups are also allow, uh, connected to the Islamic State, to the proper Islamic State in Syria and Iraq, uh, also to expand as they is, is one of their mottos. And um, this wouldn't be a great solution, in my opinion. And um, maybe uh, rather than dissolving pro problems, this would multiply them actually and uh, and create this uh, this over density, which was the 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 the, the very initial point. Uh, and uh, and so uh, this also connects me to the to the last uh, <laughs> to the last thing that I'm seeing on the screen, which is. Uh, the kind of more responsive and people-oriented and entrepreneurial turn that which we could foster in the in the um, in the Sahel. This makes, of course, still part of this big narrative about uh, the kind of solutions which we, which, that we should, as Western engineer for uh, for this West African region. But uh, of course, we shouldn't forget that it was the kind of entrepreneurial turn which was. Uh, which unfolded during the 80s and the 90s through many of uh, st structural adjustment programs in this very region that allowed for this kind of uh, phenomena to take place in the first place. And uh, I will leave the, 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 the floor to Luca to complement maybe and uh, then to the others and thank you. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yes, I, I think that the, the um, question of coordination is, is a crucial one. I think not only in terms of coordinating actors, but also, and perhaps most importantly, uh, about coordinating strategies. Um, because I think that there is a fundamental shortcoming or, or contradiction in trying to address uh, the instability in the Sahel through counterinsurgency type of tools as the ones that are deployed from a, a security perspective, while fostering at the same time uh, local ownership because I think it is very clear that in some cases local actors and local states can be part of the solution but are also part of the problem and it is very hard to uh, engineer and shape strategies that encourage local actors uh, to change while at the same time respecting local sovereignty and local sensitivities. Uh, the problem is that counter the best that counterinsurgency can achieve is perhaps the return of the state and the return of the status quo ante, which, however, is in many cases the very source of the problems that we're facing now. So 
how do you actually deal with states that very understandably resist also for post-colonial sensitivities the push for change that is brought about by foreign interveners, including uh, former colonial powers or uh, European powers, uh, while at the same time uh, respecting sovereignty. And I think that this contradiction is uh, clearly undermining, in particular, the action of uh, the French in the region, who would very much like perhaps to pull out as soon as possible from that region, which is costing them enormously, but at the same time realize that uh, they, they are in a very difficult position, uh, trying at the same time to, to uh, reassure local partners that they are indeed partners and they don't have uh, neo-colonial ambitions, while at the same time encouraging a positive change towards the adoption of different uh, standards of governance by local states. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luca. Um, uh, I think we had some very good uh, round of responses here. I mean, if I may add uh, just a little bit, and maybe Francesco also would like to add some. Um, there is a danger that this, re that this region is becoming another hot Hotel California, where you can uh, check in, but you can never leave. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm afraid of that because we, we may see in the making here another scenario like the one that we are seeing in and around Afghanistan, that we may see in, ar in and around uh, parts of uh, Iraq, Syria, that we have now seen for over 20 years in the case of Eastern Congo and so on. I mean, endless uh, external mission and programs that last and last and last. They may uh, prevent uh, total collapse, but they are not uh, anywhere near setting these uh, areas and regions to any sustainable path to recovery and le legitimate statehood either. And we have now gone through sort of a period of seven years in the Sahel since sort of the return of the international community in full in 2013 and fast forward 2020. And I mean, uh, you, you have to have a very different mirror than, uh, than the one that I have, if you, if you uh, would argue that things have improved during the last seven years. They have not. So clearly, there is a need for rethinking. Uh, the problem is only that this rethinking is, uh, is difficult, because as Luca very rightly pointed out in my point of view, the states, it, it is sort of the, the problem both starts and stops with the state. And how to sort of deal with state whose response capacity for a number of reasons is very low and limited and sometimes also un unwilling. What is very certain is that neither France nor Norway nor it Italy nor any other external actors can save the Sahel. I mean, the, uh, the, the way out of this is first and foremost something that the, the people that live in the Sahel needs to find themselves. And then, it, then the question becomes how can we as external concerned both researchers, actors and states best facilitate that local process because it needs to be a local process. And at least I think we need to be become better at understanding the local dynamics and the local processes. And we need to avoid flawed assumptions about the Sahel, like this uh, ungoverned space assumptions and others. At least there we can improve. Uh, our research can certainly improve. Um, what we have presented here, due to, uh, in spite of all the technical difficulties that we, uh, that we uh, encountered, is, in my point of view, quite a novel way of thinking about uh, research coll coll collaboration as common production of knowledge. Several of these articles are built on real collaboration between the researchers from the global north and researchers from the global south, to put it that way. And uh, everything that we do in this uh, Fragment project is also built on the same of genuine uh, co-production of knowledge. And at least that is something that we can, uh, we should use the momentum that we have to continue to build upon that. Um, at, the, at least that is something we could do from a scholarly uh, perspective. Uh, secondly, we need to sort of acknowledge that the current, I mean, a military approach is needed in the Sahel, in my point of view. It's uh, just pulling out is not going to solve anything. 
And um, that's the French dilemma, of course, that it's cost an awful lot of money and they're getting unpopular about it. But I mean, it wouldn't help anybody if, uh, if uh, France pulled out uh, all its troops. It would just, at least in the short to medium term horizon, just become even more violent, more desperate uh, and so on. But still, I mean, there is every reason to be critical of the current military uh, approach, which still is more about sort of a relatively futile hunt for people we define as terrorists in the sand dunes of the Sahel Sahara border zones and less of a focus on human centered protection. And from several of the interviews that we have done with local population, it's clear that to the extent that local communities are angry with, for example, Operation Barkhan. It's not, they're not angry by Operation Barkhan per se. They're angry because Operation Barkhan, they saw that as some, something that was going to come in and protect them. And now they see that uh, Barkhan is uh, exposing the same mobility, the same kind of governance that comes and goes as everybody else is doing. That's why they're angry with uh, Barkhan. They're not angry with Barkhan per se. They're angry because Barkhan is not able to protect them. And this is what needs to be turned around in my point of view. And unfortunately also that requires a huge shift of thinking on the French side. Because after all, I mean, yes, there are more actors involved here, uh, but French is, uh, France is still the dominant actor. They are still on the Security Council writing almost all, uh, drafting almost all Security Council resolutions on the Sahel. They have Operation Barkhane. They have uh, started other initiatives with the uh, European countries and they are the dominant voice in the EU when it comes to the Sahel. So basically, I mean, our French friends need to change some of their uh, thinking around this, I believe. That would at least, and having a more sort of open mind by all actors to how to facilitate, not solve or save the Sahel, but facilitate a uh, more positive development, uh, I think, would be a good uh, start to place, uh, start, start a uh, good starting point, because one need fresh thinking and fresh eyes on the situation of the site. Francesco, you want to add something here before yeah, we may, close? Thank you, Morten. If I may, a couple of points. Uh, the first one is that uh, there's one aspect that uh, we just touched upon in a marginal way today, but which is important, that is the, the broader struggle uh, over the, the political project that links uh, um, Islam with the, the question of sovereignty and legitimacy. And that's uh, where we see a split that is not just a split uh, that we see in the jihadist group, uh, in, in the jihadist constellations, but it's also something uh, uh, on which uh, some states are, are making a major contribution. The president of Turkey propelled by Qatari money, and on the one hand, on the other side, uh, the Gulf countries. And I feel that part of the answer to the question of France is with France uh, uh, realigning or getting a, on a closer relationship with the Emiratis, for instance, also out of the personal friendship between Macron and, and, and the prince uh, uh, in the United Arab Emirates, but not only that. So there is something that has to do with the broader picture of uh, uh, reconfiguration on a macro uh, regional scale. And as we look at that, uh, there is one aspect that I guess uh, uh, needs a bit of a sharper focus in the future, that is what is, if at all, the uh, uh, model of regional security that is emerging here. And uh, once one gets rid of the idea, once again, that there are problems out there and solutions that someone from the outer space uh, uh, devices and that there are jihadis that are coming from another planet. Once one, once one looks at the politics of intervention and uh, resilience locally, I guess uh, we can come up by now and compile a sort of an inventory of those strategies that some of us have been mentioning today. I mean, uh, Alessio was mentioning the, the, the fact that uh, um, there is always the tendency to think of the, the, the Sahara, if not as an empty space, and Morton was quite eloquent on that, as a space for engineering solutions. Now, uh, there's a, a recent article, for instance, in Nature on uh, how to solve the problems of the Sahel by basically uh, engineering a number of policies that have nothing to do, and they're not even mentioned once, with the, the existence of political systems. I mean, it is as if this is an area where political systems are irrelevant. 
Now, what we try to do with this issue is to uh, try to shed light on the fact that there are governance mechanisms. Uh, many of them have to do with traditional social clientelism, with patrimonialism, with neo-patrimonialism. There's a vast literature on that. There are new forms of um, big men, uh, hood, uh, remote governance. Uh, uh, there are ways in which the international community to pay all the way the cost of reforming politics and comes to compromise with the use of proxies and, and remote forms of governance, which create contradictions that are exploited by the violent contestation that is represented by mainly by the jihadi groups in this in this very moment. But there is a question of anger, which is broader than that, anti-colonial anger, nationalist anger, which is mounting in a number of corners and it contributes to the uh, difficulty in uh, identifying one single trajectory for the region and that's why we talk about a hybrid uh, regional order for lack of another concept and also because the concept of hybridity as you know it's something which is central to also a kind of post-colonial reading of what is going on uh, in terms of uh, 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 the how to things get done. Now one last word I would like to say is about the fact that uh, if even inside the jihadist uh, uh, radical order, if you like, there are elements that uh, are to be read in connection with, with what happens globally. For instance, the fact that Al-Qaeda or Al-Qaeda linked groups uh, with different degrees and national strategies are embarking on negotiations uh, and the Islamic State is increasingly portraying itself as a radical form of uh, armed populism that wants to do tabula rasa and comes to no compromise whatsoever. Even if that is something where we see a reverberation of what happens on a, on, a, on a broader scale, but I think there is something broader also in what we can learn about what came out at the end out of the war on terror. I mean, this is an area where, true, we look at the last 10 years, but there were 10 years before that where the first counterterrorism initiatives were deployed. I'm thinking about the US uh, Trans-Saharan initiative starting after 9-11 even. And it becomes difficult with a longer uh, um, uh, period of observation to understand whether the problem came before the solution or vice versa. What, you know, to what extent remedial strategies or preventive strategies that were deployed in the name of uh, stopping and curbing an enemy that would uh, uh, could create a major havoc and damage uh, contributed to the rigidification of issues. The, the, the migration question is probably the, the, the most clear example. We don't have yet, and hopefully we won't have in the future, cases of uh, terrorist attacks mounted on Europe from the Sahel. This is one aspect, although te fight, fighting terrorism is often evoked as a, a reason for mounting counterinsurgency in the region. On the other hand, migrations are capturing the agenda in, in uh, especially in European politics and the result is often contradictory in terms of local sustainability. If you close and, and close all, by, all borders, I'm just, it comes to my mind what uh, Donald Trump said once, say, why don't you build a huge wall across all the Sahara? That was the idea, like we did uh, with, with Mexico. Now, if you think about this as the shortcut through which uh, the Saharan space or the Sahelian space has been thought of, you also understand how new patterns of mobility and circulation in an area where circulation is crucial for living because it's the land is basically unproductive or climate variability variability is making the production very difficult is actually ending up with the entrapping people people are entrapped in areas where making a living becomes impossible the result can hardly be one that doesn't encompass form of, of rebellion and this probably strikes a note of alert that is not yet uh, in sharp focus, and I think we try to make an effort in this issue to, to call attention on that aspect. But uh, that said, I do hope that you of you, uh, those of you who bear uh, with us with all the small and large technical issues that we had, uh, uh, you know, think that um, this was good use of your time. Um, I certainly enjoyed it. I hope others enjoyed it. I think we had good conversations. Uh, this is a conversation that uh, we certainly will continue both within the group and uh, as uh, part of our external dissemination. 
Um, most of you should have received the flyer for, for this uh, webinar. Uh, from that flyer, uh, you will get access to uh, several of the articles here are open access and can be downloaded uh, freely. Others uh, uh, not so, but um, most of this is uh, readily available. I hope you will read it. I hope you will continue to engage with us. And, uh, for, um, and that said, I would just like to thank Thank everybody for uh, contributing. Um, uh, big apologies to uh, Bernardo, uh, Eduardo and uh, Abdul that we for different reasons were not able to get on. Uh, we are certainly going to repeat this in one format or another as our work continues. So there will be uh, opportunities for, um, for interaction at another uh, point in time, but for now, uh, it's all uh, it's over four o'clock and I would like to thank everybody that uh, contributed and uh, once more apologies for the technical issues that we uh, encountered, uh, but I hope you still feel uh, the, that this was a good one. So thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.